Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Prince Podcast here on Podcast Juice. My name is Michael Dean, and joining me today is a, a gentleman here who's, I guess you could say, is coming out of the shadows, uh, coming from behind the curtain, as you will. Uh, but we want to give a warm round of applause and a welcome to Mr. John Wesley Payne. Sir, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Man, thanks for uh, making yourself aware to me, and thank you for coming on. <laughs> now, let me just put some things out up front for some of the listeners, because like myself, you know, I wasn't too aware of you. I had, it's funny that I had seen you before, but it was always like, who is that? You know, who's, who's that? Who's that brother back there? Is that Jesse? Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll get into that. But um, let's just put this uh, up front. So the revolution, right? Um, had a series of concerts back in 2016 in uh, uh, September 2016 uh, at First Avenue and I remember this clearly it was a very big deal when that show came out and I remember seeing some of the clips on on uh, online and uh, there was somebody else playing in, in the back and, and again I remember some of the conversation was like who was that back there is that is that that Jesse or is that Mike Scott or something? You know, is this, who's that brother back there? So uh, that was you, uh, apparently. So man, let's start with me right there, and then we can we'll back up a little bit. But let's start right there. I mean, how did that come about? <laughs> yeah, well, it was an interesting story. Um, I guess we can start with the you know depressing day of April twenty first, twenty sixteen, right. when when the unfortunate happened, you know, you know, when Prince passed, man, I, months had passed and I, I just was paralyzed. Like probably most of us were, most of our musician friends who knew him, you know, we were just, it, we just, I just couldn't play, man. I went months without playing. I was so depressed. Mm. And I had people calling me forever about kind of promoters and everything. The week that he passed, wanting to do shows because they knew of my connection with him, whatever. And I turned everything down, man. I just was not in the place to play. Uh, so I, I didn't play for almost two months. And so the first thing I did uh, when I got back on stage um, after that, the first show was with Matt Fink. Dr. Fink called me. Okay. And he asked me to play guitar with his band for a gig we did out in uh, San Diego. And that was the first thing I did after that. And I, my head still wasn't right, man. I was just, really discombobulated just all over the place and you know the gig was cool but i you know just wasn't in the right headspace so the next gig after that was with my own band in july i played a show in the mill valley which ironically is where the doctor mm. <laughs> it was right around the corner from the doctor who was going out to meet with him that day to be treated oh, but, wow. uh, uh yeah, it's a uh, place in Mill Valley called Sweetwater, and my band was playing there. And uh, there's a segment of the show where I, toward the end where I did tribute and played Purple Rain. And on the second verse, I lost it. I broke down on the second verse, and it wasn't a dry eye in the place. And that's when I realized, you know what, I'm not ready to get out and start playing yet. I'm not ready. So mm -hmm. I just took some time off. Um, and then a few weeks after that, that's when the revolution announced that they were going to be doing their shows in October, um, September. And initially, I think it was started at September 1st, and then that sold out, then they had the second, then that sold out, then they had the third, and that sold out. So um, I went, oh, wow, that, that would be interesting. I, maybe I'll go check that out. Maybe that'll help with the healing process. So I talked to Brown Mark, who I know very well, uh, as it, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm one of the first people Mark played with when he came out of re semi retirement. And so he's like my brother, you know? Okay. And, uh, I, I was like, Hey man, you guys are doing a show. He's like, I said, hmm, I might come check that out. He goes, yeah, that'd be cool. So anyway, I, I you know, I didn't think any little thing of it. And then after the time drew close, I was like, you know what? I got this four bedroom house in Silicon Valley. I got my 10 year old daughter who's starting school that same week. I'm probably not going to make it. Mm. So I 
I came to the conclusion that I wasn't going to go. And then lo and behold, a week before uh, those shows were to happen, like the last week of August, the phone rang. And it was Brown Mark. And uh, and if anybody knows Brown Mark, everybody knows Mark don't call nobody. You know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got to hunt, you got to hunt that brother down. You know, I mean, it's like a miracle to get a return call from him. But I kept seeing these calls come from him, and he didn't leave a message first couple of times. Then he called again. He left a message said, John, get back to me. Get back to me. I said, okay, this must be serious, All right? Because he's called me like four times. So I finally called and hit him back. I said, what's going on, man? He said, look, um, we're, what's happening with you in September? Are you, you still planning to come out? I said, well, no, nah, man. I, you know, if it's not going to be a business-related thing, I've, I've realized, realized that I just don't have the lease to travel at this moment. Why? What's up? He goes, well, uh, we need you. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, it looks like the guitar position is opening up, and we're probably going to need you to come play. He said... You know, Prince, when he played, had Wendy backing him up. Well, Wendy's coming to the front now, so she's going to need someone to back her up. Hmm. And I told them that you were the guy. I said, oh, okay. (laughs) And so it's it's interesting because they had already started rehearsals back in, I guess, June or July. And, you know, not to put any shade out there because I'm not saying anything that they themselves have it already said. If you go back and look at some of the early videos with the band and with Brown Mark, they'll tell you they were kind of lost. You know, when they first got back together, they didn't know really what they were doing. They were kind of like, they were, they were sheep without a shepherd, you know, because their shepherd had gone. Mm-hmm. So when they first got back together and started rehearsing, they were just very unsure of themselves. and The confidence level wasn't where it needed to be because um, they had started preliminary preliminary rehearsals at SIR in Hollywood. Okay. And and I guess that's when the time they decided to bring Andre and Dez on as special guests. So anyway, they realized that it wasn't feeling right, and that's what Mark said, man, we need another guitar player. We need that. So I guess, you know, when they and Lisa had their group of people down in L.A., so they brought in some of these the highbrow A-list L.A. guitar guys, <laughs> and they, 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 they weren't cutting it. They didn't cut it, um, you know, because to play Prince's music, especially on guitar, you got to be a, a special kind of guitar player. Right. You know, you just you just can't jump on and play. As simple as his stuff may appear to sound, you just can't be uh, any old guitar player playing this stuff because you have to be fluent in rock, funk, jazz, and blues. You got to be able to touch on all that. Mm and be able to intertwine it all into one. And there's very few guitar players who can do that. So anyway, they went through a couple of people. It didn't work out. And then Mark was in rehearsal. He's like, look, I got the dude that could come down and play this. He could play this stuff in his sleep, you know? <laughs> and everybody kept wondering, who's he talking about? He's like, man, I know the dude. I know the dude. And then Matt Fink said, Mark, are you talking about John Payne? <laughs> <laughs> and then Mark said, yeah. And then Bob, Wendy, Lisa, and Bobby went, oh, you know him too? You know him too? And Matt went, yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah, he, he's good. He's good. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he can do this. <laughs> so on the urging of Matt and Mark Brown, um, I got flown out to Minneapolis, uh, sight unseen, sound unheard, and walked straight off the plane right into rehearsal that Monday. Mm. Um, I got the call the the 28th, I believe it was a a Friday and I had to go to Burbank that weekend to do a gig uh, on on Saturday. And it's funny because when I got on the plane to Burbank, I ran, it was this bald head brother with glasses and looked at me and I looked at him. I said, man, he looks familiar. And then as we landed in Burbank, I realized it was Van Jones. (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and he came over and he goes hey man because he, he told me with my guitar I, and I realized this realized what he was I said hey what's up man I said it's funny running into you guess where I'm flying out to tomorrow and he goes where I'm flying to Minneapolis Revolution mm-hmm. asked me to play with them so it was a sign you know all these things started coming together right. but anyway okay. 
Um, after I did my gig in Burbank, I got on the plane, flew to Minneapolis first thing Monday, and as I mentioned, walked straight from the airport right into rehearsal, sat up, and started playing. And, um, you know, well, well, actually, I just started warming up, you know, Mm because Mark had took my amp to Minneapolis. He was in California for a minute, so he came. This is when he was still staying in in, uh, the Bay Area. And he came there, and we met for a minute, and he grabbed my amp, and he took it with him. So, uh... Wow. You have to excuse if you hear any sound. It's raining. It's oh, raining you're hard. Fine. You're good. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, I got there. I started plugging in my gear, setting up, and warming up. And you know, none of no one was in the room. I was. It was just me and some of the sound techs. And so I started. I started playing the ending. I played the ending guitar solo of "Let's Go Crazy" to uh-huh. warm up on. Well, that's your warm up. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you know, because I was trying, to, I was getting into Prince mode, you know, and Bobby Z came running in the room. He was like, "What? What? What? <laughs> what was Dad Ringer? Dad Ringer? Like, I, I, you know, he was like surprised." And then Wendy walked in, and she started throwing her nine volt batteries at me, <laughs> like, "You bleaking show off!" <laughs> 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 you know, and I was like, no, no, I'm just warming up. I didn't know you guys were even in here, you know. So anyway, we got in there and we just, you know, it, it meshed, you know, we meshed together. And I, you know, I sat back, you know, you know, when I'm in a situation, I just don't jump in. I sit back and try to get in where I fit in. And so when they started playing, I was listening to what was missing, what was needed both musically and vocally. Hmm. Then the second time around, when it's time to start playing, that's when I started adding things. And then uh, things started coming together. And everybody's chest started, you know, sticking out. Like, oh, okay, yo, yeah, yeah, that's right. We are the revolution. <laughs> yeah, this, this, is the way, this is the way it's supposed to sound. You know, because what happened was no one was singing Prince's parts. Mm. So that's why it sounded kind of empty, you know. No one, those that middle part wasn't wasn't being taken up by anyone, and you know. And please understand for those of the, who may be listening, no one can replace Prince. There's no replacement, you know. But if you're going to be doing his material, you got to do it right, and you got to do it close to right, especially if you're the source fan. So. Let me let me ask you this real quick because I I had I had a chance to see their their tour uh, it was last year and by the time that I saw it uh, to me it was very apparent that Brown Mark seemed to really had stepped up into that lead position you know he was singing a lot of the songs and he was sort of up front was that was that the case when you, when you were in there were they still trying to sort of find their way a little bit they were still finding their way you know. Um, that's the reason why we kind of brought in some of the extra help that we had and special guests like Alau and um, Kimbra. Stokely. And then, you know, uh, well, Stokely wasn't with us on those gigs. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Sto- yeah, Stokely came later. Um, but I'm talking about those three nights, uh, the three nights in Minneapolis at First Avenue. You know, we had some reinforcements mm. to help. You know, yeah, so, you know, that's why Bilal came and did a couple of songs and uh, Kimbra. And then on one night, I think we had Princess. And then we had Wendy's sister, um, Susanna, okay. helping us vo- vocally, too, on some things. So, uh, yeah, you know, that, 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 that went on later, I think, because, you know, I was only, I only contracted to do the three nights with them. Okay. And there, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> there's a reason for that. But when I when I first got there, things were a little disheveled. There were a lot of emotions, obviously, and, and for obvious reasons. And you know, I, I you know I'm not gonna you know uh, disclose too much for the sake of you know sure, no. <laughs> loyalty. To, to, yeah, to no my, doubt. My friendship. No, no doubt. But there was, there was some, yeah, there was there was some very sensitive points in those in those three days right before the show. You know, we had to we only had three days to get that show together because with this 
we were playing Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we only had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to make it happen. Was, and, uh, was, it came the, was the set list or the songs, was that already chosen before you got there? Or were we still? Yeah. Playing? Okay. Yeah, they already had the set list together, what they wanted to do, and uh, and what songs they wanted me to play on. Um, you know, of course, when Andre and Dez came up, you know, I was able to pull back because that's, that's already enough guitar, enough funk right there. <laughs> so, um, uh, but it was great. And also, you just had a chance to rekindle a lot of relationships. For example, I was in rehearsal, and, you know, I've known Andre Simone since 1988. Okay. You know, but we hadn't seen each other since then. So when we're in rehearsal, you know, they, you know, we all walk around each other, you know, no one's speaking, you know, I guess they just thought I was a roadie or whatever. But then when the revolution got to re-rehearse their stuff and I got on guitar and we started playing, you know, and there's an Andre was like, oh, who's that brother? You know? So later Andre came over and introduced himself. He said, Hey man, what's up? Uh, nobody introduced us. Uh, my name's Andre. I said, Negro, I know who you are. <laughs> I said, we go way back. I said, I'm about to kill you right now. We got history. What? 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 I said, 1988, Studio City. You're producing Jody. Your bandmates were producing this cat, John Payne. That was you. That was you. I said, yeah, man. That kid was me. And props out to Gary Kinnebrew and Greg Porter. Uh, those are two guys that were in Andre's band and they, um, they produced me, you know, from my, when I decided to go become, you know, go the route as an independent solo art, they took me under their wing and a lot of chops on production. They, they're the reasons why I'm in, I know a lot about production as I do, you know, Gary Kinnebrew and those guys, they had a company called G index production. They were very instrumental in producing Taja Seville's first record, oh, okay. um, which was one of, one of the first records on Paisley Park. Mm -hmm. um, so them, along with uh, another really incredible talented guy named Chico Bennett, um, they all the, all those guys were in Andre's band. So um, they had a place not too far from Andre during that time, and Andre would come by and uh, listen to my material, and he would give us advice. And he also helped set up a meeting with. Uh, um, was it Lil Silas or Gerald Busby? One of them at MCA because Andre was like the man at MCA at the time because he had just produced Jody Watley. Okay. And Jody's stuff at looking for a new love. Yeah, and man. Some kind of love. Yeah. All that stuff went through the roof. So so it was funny. So I was like throwing all that stuff in his face. I was like, dude, Carlos and Charlie. <laughs> the night they, the, the Crips and the Blood started shooting. He was hanging out with a cat named Julian Jackson. Blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, man, you know, freaking all this stuff up. And he was like, man, I can't right. believe it. You know, so we all came full circle and was right. back brothers again, you know. Okay. But it was it was a great experience, man. Um, you know, in spite of uh, whatever technicalties, difficult technicalties, technical difficulties they may have been, um, it was right up there on that bucket list, you know, where you first, you get a call from Prince, and then almost over 10 years later, you get a call from his band to come play for, with them. Wow. So, that, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And those shows were very well received. Um, but to hear from your point of view and just to hear that camaraderie and just like that you know, like you said, rekindling that relationship. He's, oh, I remember, yeah, back in. That's some very important stuff uh, on the musician level, but just on a personal level, right? Like to be able to sort of come yeah. back around. Um, I want to back up just a little bit, and we'll come back to uh, some of the things you mentioned here. But we got to go back to you mentioned your your music, and you were working uh, on your stuff in '88. So I want to go all the way back to that, like, oh, God. yeah, man. Talk to me about like, uh, you know, the, the John Wesley Payne project you were just talking about because I know, and I was very much a music uh, listener head back in '88. So that's my time frame. So like, I'm very curious to like, uh, and then you were working with, you know, see the guys. What was the name again? Uh, of those producers? What was it? Gary Gary Kennebrew, Greg Porter. 
Okay. Shout out to and those it, brothers. And there was another. Yeah, man, those guys were super, super duper bad, man. And I mean, um, you know, they were very tight with uh, John McClain over at A and M, who had signed Jesse Johnson at the time. And and there was another super bad group out of Minneapolis that never had a chance to see the light of day, mm. but the stuff was smoking, and they were on A and M. It was a group called Cinema, oh. and Craig, uh, yeah, a guy named Craig Holliman. You know, God rest his soul, he's not with us any longer, but he was a genius. They had an album called Wrong House, mm. and uh, they were also over there at A&M with John McClain. And so, you know, the Minneapolis sound was really yeah. strong back then, you know, and, uh, and yeah, it was powerful, a powerful movement. But, yeah, they turned me on to the stuff cinema, and I was like, man, who's this group? You know, and they were, I mean, if anybody get a chance, go and listen, find that album. It's a group called Cinema, and the album's called Wrong House. This this project was before its time. They had one single that kind of came out. It was called Let Me Put You In My Pocket. Do you remember that? No, nah, I'm I'm looking it up as you speak. Let me I put hear. you in my pocket. Okay. Put you <laughs> in my pocket, baby. It was funky. But anyway, this was all during that time when we were, you know, when they were producing me. Yeah. And, uh, with, um, so, oh, okay. Yeah. I see it right here. What, um, and so you, you, you were coming out, you were going to do a solo thing. Is that what it was? Or? <laughs> yeah. Well, what happened was I was originally part of a group. Um, and, uh, Gary and Greg, Gary Kimber and Greg Porter, they were also working with, as I mentioned, they were working with Warner brothers with Paisley park, which was distributed to Warner brothers. And Warner kind of put them in touch with us to produce our group. And out of everyone in the group, they singled me out. You know, they were like, you know, it was inevitable inevitable that the group probably wasn't going to stay together. Mm. And eventually it didn't. But they said, well, look, if this thing doesn't work out, we want to work with you. And so that's what ended up happening. You know, when the group broke up, we reconnected, and they started working on, with me on my material. And what, what ended up happening with your, your material? Did you come out, or what, what happened with that? We got really, really close to a lot of a lot of deals, like signature away from deals, but a lot of deals weren't right. Mm. And so, you know, during that time, man, you know, there was a very clicky time in L.A. and in the music industry. You know, you had to really be in the right scene and, and play the game the right way. And I, unfortunately, was not able to do that. You know, I just wanted to focus on music. Mm. And also, I think the music that I was doing, too. This was also during a time when hip-hop and rap was starting to change right. the wave of things. Yeah, New Jack Swing so, was just bubbling at this time. Exactly. So... That was the thing, man. You know, uh, they, MCA had just got Uptown Records, right, you know, right. with uh, Grady Orell and Teddy. So the sound was changing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, people weren't trying to hear no rock guitar and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of said, well, maybe the major label route isn't for me. And that's when I stepped back and decided to go with an independent label. And I, so I left L.A. and I came back to San Francisco. And then I ended up signing with a small independent label called Man Network. And um, that's where my independent artist career began. And I put my first album out with, through them. Okay. How many albums have, yeah. you, have you put out? <laughs> well, it's only been, as far as a solo artist, only two. Okay. You know, because I've been working on so many other different projects in between. Um, after I got out of that first deal, I, again, I took time off and just reverted back into being a musician because I was getting so caught up in the politics of the business and, you know, with the artists and dealing with the label. And I was starting to lose my love for music and for, for this business. And I was like, you know, when it gets to that point, you got to step away. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I did. I, I pulled out and then I just started being a session player and started playing bass and guitar behind different people, which was the best decision I made because during that time 
I ended up hooking up with George Clinton. You know, um, he kind of we inst- we instantly had a bond, man. We what happened? I was working with a artist named Big Brother Soul, and he was one of the original founding members of Digital Underground. Um, uh, and um, really? okay. Yeah, is, this, is it got yeah, something to yeah, do yeah, with what's that? Uh, let me ask you real quick. Uh, what what was the uh, ah? They had that song Spirit. Was that something to do with? Yeah, Force One, Force, Force One Network. Yeah. Same same guy. Okay, that's I know who you're talking <laughs> about. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Same guy, same guy. Shout out, shout out to Will and Jimmy Dright. Yeah, those are the same guys. But uh, yeah, I was working in the studio with them, and ironically enough there was somebody next door recording and I didn't know I was playing a guitar solo on a song and my amp was in the isolation room and it was making a buzzing noise. So I went into the isolation room to fix my amp. And then I see these colored dreadlocks sticking with the head sticking through the door. (laughs) And it was George Clinton in there listening to me. And he said, just keep playing, keep playing. Don't say nothing. He didn't want to let them know they were ear hustling on what we do it. And then he said, hey, 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 man, hey, when you finish over there, come over here and put some of that on my stuff. When you finish over there, come put some of that on my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right. So uh, I finished up the session with, with Big Brother Soul, and then I went next door and started working with George instantly. And when I plugged in and I warmed up, and he went, oh, You've been waiting for this. Oh, you, oh, you, you, you was ready for this. T- turn him up. Oh, oh, you, you, you got more licks than the law in the house. <laughs> you got more licks than the law. He said, "Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Everything all the other pro- other, uh, everything the other produce- producers told you not to do, that's what I want you to do. Mm. Everything the other producers told you not to do, that's what I want you to do." And then that was that. And uh, I started jamming with him on some rec- recordings, and then. They were playing a show in town in San Francisco that that same week we were recording at the Warfield, Legendary Warfield Theater. And he mm-hmm. said, look, man, why don't you come jam with us? Come jam. And, uh, man, he they called me out on stage, and I took a 15-minute guitar solo, man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he, he called me out and pointed to the middle of the stage, told me to stand there, and he took his mic and put it on my amp, you know, because they had this whole uh, line of Mesa Boogie triple rectifier amps, whole stack, and m- my stuff was loud. He took his mic and put it on the amp, and he said, turn him up, turn him all the way up. <laughs> and I just, wah, 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 just started wailing, man. I just went to another place. You know? <laughs> wow, that's amazing, man. When George Clinton <laughs> tell you that, yeah, you chosen right there. I mean, that was it. Mm-hmm, for sure. Oh man, well, it's amazing. That's the reason why I have such a open-minded uh, approach when I have my band. You know, I want everybody in my band to be bad. And I want I want everybody in my band to show their stuff, man. And that's where I learned it from with George, because George wants you to throw down. You know, he wants you to be the baddest that you can be. And so when you get on that stage, he wants you to turn up and he wants you to just get out, man. Uh, That's why when I play with people and I have to kind of feel squelched or or subdued or quote unquote put in the corner, it's kind of foreign to me because, you know, George kind of spoiled me, you know, he was like, man, be, do you go out there and do you because whatever you do is just going to make me look great anyway. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. so that's the wisdom in, in what he does man that's why he's been around for so long you know he when you're in the studio with George it's like you in the you, like somebody you just got in the studio with for the very first time mm. I mean he still has that pure genuine love for music man you know and it was such an inspiration working with him I mean working with that's that's how I got my my first endorsement deal I got from playing with him that night. It was a, a rep from Dean Markley Strings who ended up kind of becoming like a brother to me. His name was Merle Saunders. Shout out to Merle Saunders. Merle saw me playing and he pulled me aside. He said, hey, here's my card. 
you need to call me first thing Monday morning. And I called him Monday morning and I had boxes coming to my house Tuesday morning and they haven't stopped since. Damn. Okay. <laughs> and the, yeah. And that was back in 1999. That was back in 2000. So yeah. Man, okay. Props to George, man. So, yeah. And, and I imagine how that must have felt like, you know, being in that studio and then him coming in the room and like, you know, introducing and telling you all that. I, <clears throat> uh, and I'm saying that because, you know, knowing like what all those albums meant and his whole movement and all that. And I kind of wanted to go back a little bit to just to, to your um, sort of getting into music uh, to sort of set all these guys in context to you. Like, wh where are you from? When did you, you know, get in the urge to pick up an instrument and start playing? Well, man, I'm originally from Oakland, California. Okay. I don't, yeah, I'm originally from Oakland, where, as you know, Prince borrowed from mm -hmm. quite regularly. <laughs> <laughs> he borrowed a lot of us from Oakland. So it, it, it's no surprise that sooner or later he and I, our paths were going to cross, no matter who tried to keep us apart. But I'm originally from Oakland, and... Uh, you know, I, I got the urge playing because my house was full of music. My mom listened to Jackie Wilson, Sam Cooke, Mahalia Jackson, James Cleveland, um, you know, all the gospel and, and, and root R&B from the beginning. And then my sister-in-law, Carolyn, she had very eclectic taste. So she listened to Elton John, Chicago, uh, Journey, Tom Jones, Sly and the Family Stone, uh, Jim Croce, <laughs> you know, all this rock funk stuff. And then my brother Jerome, who was in the military, my oldest brother, he was making money. So he was able to like <laughs> buy everything. This was back, this was back when the boom boxes was out. This was when that, the Earth, Wind and Fire used to advertise that platinum. Panasonic Platinum, the, the big boom boxes with the, you know, and he would buy one of those every year, get the newest one, and he bought cassette tapes after cassette tapes. So from him, I learned about the Bar Cave, mm. you know, um, Come Function, Bo Hannon, Barry White, Brass Construction, uh, you know, Kashif, um, you know, of course, Parliament Funkadelic. All that stuff, man. All that stuff. I mean, just the source material, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, getting back to my cousin Carolyn with her eclectic taste, she also had the desire to play guitar. And so she had a guitar, an electric guitar laying around. And I took it upon myself to try to learn those songs that I liked. Okay. And try to teach myself to play them on guitar. So as everybody knows, the guitar has six strings. The, the, the top four strings on the guitar, G, D, A, E, are the same four strings that are on the bass. So what happens was when she was, you know, it was also she was a big Jimi Hendrix fan as well. Can't forget that. And so I would try to emulate playing Jimi Hendrix and hit those high notes, and I would always pop the E and B strings. I would always pop the last two strings. And so when those strings were gone, then I would just revert to playing the bass on the top four strings. Oh, wow. And so that's how I learned how to play guitar and bass at the same time. So this is all self-taught. You didn't go to like no schools or have an instructor other than the records. <laughs> well, you know, I took music in school and stuff and I okay. tried, I tried to be formally trained, but the teachers all hated my guts because <laughs> before they could try to teach me anything, I already knew it. Mm. And so, well, the one teacher, her name was Vivian Jones. I'll never forget it. She was trying to teach me something on the keyboards, like, eh, 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 and I went, <laughs> <laughs> start playing, start playing the, the Liberace when doves cry solo. On the, and she just like went, you know what? You, you just don't belong in here. You know, you don't belong here. You, you, you know, this, this is not for you. Okay, you already got it. You just, you just don't belong. She just got really frustrated with me, man. So I said, "Well, hey, let me just take what I got already and rock with it." So I had my first band 
and uh, and high and well, I had my first band in junior high school, mm. and then that translated over into high school, and uh, where I um, was playing in the band, the jazz band, and then we had a rock band, okay. which ironically included uh, some some um, Barry musicians who formed another group, and uh, so I, you know. That's how it all began, man. We just started playing in bands, and I started playing in clubs when I was 16, 17 years old and using my mother's mascara to paint <laughs> a mustache on my face <laughs> yeah. to try to look older. <laughs> <laughs> That's that hustle. <laughs> look, yeah, man. It's, what, uh, what, well, let me, so it can help me put things in perspective. What year did you graduate from high school? What's your I don't want to tell you that. Oh man, come here you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would imagine. Let's just put it this way: it sounds like you came through in the eighties at some point, right? Got to be in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, it was. That was. That was. That was like the the origin. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I, I asked that because you know, and back in them days, like. Cats had bands like there was, you know, cats were having bands and, and playing instruments. And it was just before sort of, again, as you mentioned earlier, music was changing and it was before, you know, everyone was trying to be a DJ and then, you know, getting into the drum program and the sampling and all that kind of stuff where it sort of shifted a little bit. But, right. you know, so being in a band situation and you're doing gigs now, what was and I wanted to ask, where is uh Prince at this time, because uh, you mentioned you were doing Do- when doves cry with the teacher. So I mean, that's like you know a little further into his yeah. thing. Yeah, well, 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 Prince started back in junior high. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, actually, elementary school. You know, so when the first album came out, the For You album, and Soft and Wet. First of all, Soft and Wet we just broke. You know, see, I'm not one of these Purple Rain, no no disrespect to any of you beautiful Prince fans out there, but I'm not one of these bandwagon Purple Rain Prince fans. Okay. I go back to the first album okay. <laughs> because the cold-blooded thing about it is that he recorded the album out in the Bay Area. In the, in the West, right. Right across the bridge, right across the bridge from my house in Sausalito at the plant. Okay. So... Uh, you know, and then what's ironic is the engineer who worked on my first album worked on that record, worked on that the, some of those sessions with him, uh, Richie Corsello. He okay. worked on my first album. Mm-hmm. He worked over there at Sausalito on the plant with uh, Prince on some of those sessions. But anyway, going back to, the, you know, we touching on Prince, Soft and Wet was my first introduction. And that record blew me away because I had never heard since synthesizers mm. sound that funky. I had never heard because the whole people don't realize that whole record was all synths. There ain't no guitar on that record. Mm. He's not playing any guitar on that record. That's all synthesizers. And so it sounded different. He was ahead of the game back then because you know later on everything started being keyboards through MIDI and everything. Mm. But he did that record as his first single and it was all keyboards. I had never heard such sound that fluid. And I think that's the that's what he was going for. That's why he named the record Soft and Wet, because he wanted the keyboard to sound wet. So that... Yeah. It's like, what the... I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> so it was um, keyboards. That was some of the baddest stuff I had heard since Billy Preston, you know, or, or Herschel Happiness from... Graham Central Station, you know, uh, I said, man, that's my ears perked up from that point on. And so I had kept this cat in my radar. Okay. And so then, of course, the second record came out was why you want to treat me so bad and want to be your lover. You know, why you want to treat me so bad, bad blew me away because it was like it was a rock tune. Mm-hmm. But it had but it had R&B overtones, you know. And then this cat was singing in like a, a high, smoky Robinson falsetto. <laughs> it's a talk going outside. I'm like, whoa, okay, how are you going to be able to sing that live like that with all the rock guitars going on, you know? <laughs> but it was Prince. That was what made Prince 
be Prince. It was a whole different thing. And so we got locked into that. And also, too, I'm from the church. Okay. And one thing about being a musician from the church, you have to be a bad dude Mm -hmm. on everything. Right. You know, it's just, that's just like required. You can't be a mediocre musician uh, and, and when you're playing in the choir because you ain't going to be playing. So uh, point, point blank. We already, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the choir directors, you know, they, be, they don't play. So we had that foundation coupled with the fact that, you know, we found out that this cat was playing everything. And then we already had Stevie Wonder. Mm-hmm who was already playing everything on his records and he was blind. And so it was like, <laughs> Just forget about really it. tripping us. You know, so all, yeah. I grew up in an amazing time, man, where yeah. if you were to be a musician, you had to be the best, you know? What did you, uh, <clears throat> do you remember when, um, and I asked this cause I remember when I first heard it and I was just kind of even getting the idea of wanting to do music. But do you remember when the time first came out? Like get up, oh, get yeah. up. Like I don't. To me, I remember like I was like, man, what is this? And then when they just had like that long, you know, the guitar solo was just going through. But it was a funk record. But I was just, I didn't know. I had no idea it was Prince at all. But I just remembered. I was like, mm-hmm. damn, this is this is the shit right here. And this was at well, the you, time when Zap and stuff was starting to pop too. But right. Well, you know what? When I first heard that Time record, I felt it was Prince because the way it was recorded, that whole kind of dirty, cloudy, mm. soggy analog sound where that bottom end was so fat, it sounded just like the Dirty Mind record. Okay. And, 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 and it's a trip that even at that age, my head could hear the difference between things sonically. I could sonically tell the difference between things, you know, and I could tell that that record had to be cut either on the same year or in the same studio that Prince cut the Dirty Mind record because the sonically they sound exactly the same. Now, song wise and vocally and musically, yeah, it's different. But if you're really spiritually in tune mm-hmm. to the one and to the source, you can go deeper and go, wait a minute, there's a famili- familiarity here. And then if you listen close to the falsetto, you can, you hear, can hear Prince sing yeah. it. Mm-hmm. You know, you hear Morris's voice on the low. Get it up, get it. Then you hear Prince. You ready for a good time? You hear yeah. you hear <laughs> pop on there. And so I'm like, man, that's that's Prince. And then when I saw the album cover, the album cover was shot in black and white, just like the Dirty Mind album okay, cover right, was shot in right. black and white. <laughs> and then I said, wait a minute, this dude looks like Prince with a suit on. <laughs> you know. When I first saw Morris Day on that album cover, I said, he, he looks kind of like Prince with a, but a more masculine version, you know? And I mean, I'm no offense by saying that because, you know, every, we all know Prince purposely went for the androgyny right, thing, right. you know? So I guess to totally differentiate that, he's like, look, I'm going to put this group together and look like it was some pimps who decided to put a band together, <laughs> exactly. you know? And, and, and that's what we thought when we first saw the time. We were like, oh, these are like a bunch of pimps who just decide, man. <laughs> yeah, man, let's get together and go do some gigs. <laughs> it was cold with it. it. Yeah, it was, man. And then and then it's so funny, uh, again, years later, you know, Jelly Bean Johnson, one of my friends, man, you know, we talk all the time. And, you know, whenever they come out here play, takes care of me, and we end up, being friends, you know, okay. man, it's just one of the things that, like, like I said, you, you come full circle to grow up, listen to these people mm-hmm. and then to turn around and have them call you up on the phone <laughs> out of the blue. Right. Wow. What, you know, what, what was, uh, so man, you, you guys, you're doing your thing. Of course, you know, these, these records, uh, are coming out and having quite the influence and that Minneapolis sound, you know, that sort of starts to shape that time period, you know, things morph into that, that style. Uh, were you influenced by that sound? And even, it, even not just the sound, but obviously the visual aspect of Prince and what he brought to the table was very heavy at that time as well. Was that, a, were those things really influencing you at, at that time as well? Absolutely, man. Everybody in the game 
everybody in the game was influenced by it. If they say they weren't, they lying. <laughs> if they're a brother who grew up in the 80s and wasn't wearing some pointy toe boots and didn't have a jerry curl <laughs> say that. and say they weren't influenced, they lying because the influence was strong, man. You know, that's why you had all these other little groups come out, you know, like uh, Ready for the World mm-hmm. and Z Look. And uh, there's a bunch of them that came out, you know, uh, Exotic Storm, who was signed to RCA. And who else? There was a bunch of groups that came out. And so that's why in hindsight now, as I look back, man, I am so thankful to God that none of my stuff came out as a major label back then. Because <laughs> <laughs> this predates Facebook and everything, so you ain't got nothing on me. You need them pictures. Yeah, now, where are the pictures at now? <laughs> there, there's, there's a few pictures. There might be some few pictures. I know whoever listens to this, they'll probably go into the crate and start digging some stuff up. But, uh, you know, at large, though, I was not out there in the public eye. Mm. And I didn't, you know, so it was a blessing that I didn't sign a record deal back then. <laughs> it's funny because I talked to a lot of the A&R guys who who uh, I shot my stuff to back then. I, I'm friends with them now, you know, on Facebook and we talk, you know, mm. like Eric Nury and uh, Steve Buckley who was at Motown. And man, you know, I, I say to them, I said, man, thank you. <laughs> thank you for not signing me. <laughs> Cause I, I go back and I'm listening to some of this stuff and I'm like, I wasn't ready. You know, I mean, I would have been ready for that particular time, but now it's like, you know, it would be in comparison to be dated, you know what I'm saying? You know, mm. to, to what, where I am right now. So I'm just thankful, man. Things happen for a reason. You sure. know, I realize in life when, when, when the opportunity's right at the door, and then the, the shift changes and the direction changes. Mm-hmm. It's for a reason because it's like, okay, that wasn't for you, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm so thankful, man, when you, when you try to sit back and allow yourself to be led by the spirit mm-hmm. and not try to take so much in your own hands and just let the spirit guide you, things will come to you without trying, man. And I'm living proof of that. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to get all super spiritual. No, we're good. We're good with that. Keep going. Some people say, well, you know, anything worth, you know, anything worth having for, you know, you know, you have to struggle for everything that's worth having, whatever. And that's not necessarily true. You know, you know, it says in the scripture, you know, it's the blessings of God that makes fat and he adds no pain with it. Hmm. It's in Proverbs. And it says, it's the blessings that come from God that makes you rich. And when he blesses you, he adds no pain with it. So when it's meant for you to have, boom, it's going to happen. And can't nobody take it away from you. Okay. So over the years, I've run into a lot of people and they go, man, how, how, how did you do that? How, how'd you get that gig? How, man, I, I've been watching you over the years, man, and things just come to you. And I go, you know, that's, that's God, man. That's God watching mm-hmm. over me. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, you know, like I said, to to be called by your mentors and to be able, you know, it's funny because people go, hey, man, uh, there's Stevie Wonder over there, man. Who's going to talk? I said, no, 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 I'm not going to go chasing after Stevie. Mm. I said, when I meet Stevie, me and him going to be in a room somewhere jamming together. Mm. We're going to be in the studio. And. Lo and behold, that's the way it's always been, you know, with, with, whether it's been with me and George Clinton, me and Larry Graham, me and Prince, me and the Revolution, or whoever it is that I've been blessed to encounter and become friends with. It's always come easily, you know, and because and it, it was meant to be. So wow. I'm thankful for that, man. All right. Um, let me uh, take the time to also, we want to uh, welcome in. Big, sexy, and sack. He, he's been sitting on the side listening to us. Sir, how are you? I'm doing great. Sorry for being late. I got my time mixed up. So, uh, I was out at the gym doing my thing, but I'm here now. All right. Well, getting back to, to, to Mr. Payne, uh, Payne's story. So, um, and you said some meeting your mentors and having these opportunity to, to meet them, but, but then also you are like very ready to, to deliver and to stand with them as almost as equals in terms of your skills and what you bring to the table. What was it like when you uh, 
finally, you know, got the call from Prince, you know, sort of lead us into that a little bit. Man, well, that that was a, a very interesting day. Um, well, how that even started was, um, you know, Larry Graham's son and I, Derek, had a band together. And it was called the Graham Payne Express. GP Express. We were supposed to be the next version of Graham Central Station. Okay. You know, that's what we were going for. <laughs> and I was on bass and Derek Graham was on vocals and I was, you know, I was on bass and vocals. And so what happened is Larry had got wind of the group that we were doing. We, we started doing some gigs and making some noise. And so Larry had began to try to mentor us. So he would call us from Minneapolis while we were in the studio and uh, uh, we were working on a tune. He'd be like, uh, no, put that vocal right there. <laughs> All right, now try this, try that. You know, and he'd be like, you know, over the phone coaching. So what happened, long story short, long story long, an uh, opportunity came up where the California Music Awards were coming up, which were known as the Bammies. As a matter of fact, they're having their 25th year anniversary concert tonight in San Francisco, which, which is where I was, where I'll be going actually. But, uh, they had this concert coming out and it was outside. It was huge. And they were going to be honoring Larry Graham and Sly and the Family Stone. And so they approached our band, the Grand Payne Express and asked if we played a show, we, if we would do the finale, close it out. And we were like, Oh yeah, yeah. You know, makes sense, you know, because that's what our band is, that's what we were going for. We were like the new generation, Sly and the Family Stone, Larry Graham. We had Graham's son in the band and some of the other members, you know, that were offsprings of other people. And so Green Day, who's also our Bay Area uh, fellow musician, they came, they introduced us, and we went out, we did the show with Larry. Prince and Carlos Santana was supposed to show up that day. Matter of fact, Larry did an interview with the local radio station called KBLX and announced on the radio that Prince was coming. And he said, yeah, my baby brother's showing up. He even told me what guitar he's bringing. And, uh, and then everybody went nuts. So I think what happened was some of the promoters were trying to lock Prince down to ensure he was coming. As you all know, you don't lock Prince down for right, nothing. Right. You know, because <laughs> the moment you did that, he's going to say no. So anyway, he didn't show up, but he saw a videotape. And you know, and his drummer, who's also a friend of mine, John Blackwell, God rest his soul, uh, he played that gig with us, and um, it was an amazing gig. And so Prince saw he didn't come to the gig, but he saw a videotape, and he said, "Who's that guitar player?" And Larry's like, "Oh, that's like my son. You know, I taught him everything. It was like my son." And John Blackwell's like, "Yeah, man." For you. Dude is bad, Prince. You gotta check him out. You gotta check him out. Bring him here. I want to meet him. Bring him before me. <laughs> so, um, as as if the day couldn't get any better, I was coming from Petaluma, from a company called Mesa Boogie, and they make all the top guitar amplifiers. They had just signed me to an endorsement deal that day. I just got mm. brand new guitar and bass amps. So I'm riding across the Golden Gate Bridge on this beautiful spring day, happy as hell, got brand new amps. And then the phone rang. And my business partner at the time, he answered the phone. He said, oh, John, it's for you. And I said, who is it? He said, some guy named Takumi. Takumi from Paisley mm. Park. Mm. I said, oh, okay. I said, hey, what's up? He said, hey, John, what's up? Uh, this is Takumi, you know, uh, Prince wants to know if you could come out and, uh, you know, Paisley and jam with us and uh, we want to set up a flight and you know blah 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 I said yeah that'd be cool <laughs> and then he said John hold on for a second uh, yeah no, the CMFV can do that, but, no, no. yeah oh yeah Prince wants to know if you can bring your pedals you know so he was there on the side again. and he wants to bring your pedals he wants you to bring your guitar and your guitar pedals and he said that's all you need to worry about we'll have everything else set up for you I said okay so uh, I was supposed to go out uh, I think a week from the call and he called me back. He said, look, Prince wants to know you could come out earlier. You could come out first thing Monday because he wants you to come in and get acclimated to the environment. And I was like, acclimated to the environment. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be settled, get settled into the, what? <laughs> okay. okay. So I get on the plane, I go up there and, you know, everybody who's been flown out by Prince, they know how it is. They have a guy there at the airport with 
with the sign, you know, John Payne from Paisley, you know, Paisley Park for John Payne. And uh, they took me, and, and the brother took care of me, man. I mean, let, I had a car at my back. Let me, oh, I got to stop you right here. Hold on for a second, because you're a very modest brother. But come on, man. You was, I want to know how you felt when you got that call. Like, did you believe that? Or, I mean, were you excited? Or, you know, after all the stuff you've been through, and then you get this call from Prince, like, did that, what did that feel to you, man? Well, I, I kind of, I was excited and I was, I was happy, but I kind of knew it was coming because before that, Larry had called me. Okay. Larry's like, um, uh, what are you doing uh, next week? I said, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, uh, you think you might want to jam? And I said, um, yeah, it would be cool. He goes, okay, well, uh, give me an email. Give me a, give me an email. And, uh, somebody will be in touch with you. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So I gave him my email. I didn't think nothing about it. And then the call came. Mm. And then that was that was when Takumi called me. So I was like, oh. and that's when, so yeah. As I as I hung up on the call, and I told my buddy Don, I said, "Hey man, that was Prince. They want me to come out to Paisley Park next week." And he said, "Really?" He <laughs> <laughs> said, "What? What?" I go, "Yeah, man." So it's funny because I hey, I still got. The flight number, okay. the, the ticket stub, and everything. That's what so, I'm talking about. I got proof. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's so funny is when I got there, Prince's, I mean, Larry's uh, sister-in-law, Sheila, who's his, who's uh, Tina Graham, his wife, Tina Graham's sister, she was there. She just happened to be out there visiting. So she was there, and she witnessed the whole thing. So it's funny because when I run into her, at some of the assemblies and stuff, because she's, you know, Jehovah's Witness and whatnot. And so, uh, you know, and I, I go occasionally to the meetings and I run into her and she looks at me like, yeah, I sat in on your dream. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody tries to dispute it, like you it. got you got someone outside of yourself who can verify it, you know. She said, but, I sat oh, really? in on your dream. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the look she gives me, you know. Yeah, but man, the brother was so cool with me, man, and um, he, he he was so generous and treated me really cool, man. I mean, that's one thing about Prince. As, as people who know him can tell you, when when he's when you cool with him, he, he feels cool with you. The sky's the limit, you know. He's very generous, you know. Just don't get on that other side. <laughs> 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 Just don't get on that Gemini side, you know. But he's really cool, man. And I, and I think the only reason why it came in like that, you know, you know, on that level is because I was referred to him by his mentor, right? Who he has rever had reverential respect for, and his drummer. So he had heard my name coming at him in stereo. So he was like, "Okay, I got to meet this dude." If you know, because he really respected John Blackwell's playing as a drummer. I mean, just and so he's like, "Okay, well, if you guys are saying this stuff, I got to meet this dude." And so we got out there, man. We hit it off immediately, and he was just really cool. And we talked back. You know, if anybody knows Paisley Park and the. MPG, MPG Music Club room. I mean, they've changed it all around now. Mm -hmm. But the smaller room, which is adjacent to the huge soundstage area, that's where they rehearsed the band. Okay. That's where him and the band rehearses. And it's the one that got the big MPG Music Club carpet on the floor. Mm -hmm. Right behind, right as you walk into your right, there's a mixing board. And behind that mixing board, there's a little office there. And we, he and I sat there and talked for maybe at least an hour. He just, we were just talking about everything. And that's how I know how much love he had for the time and for Jesse, how much he respected Jesse Johnson and stuff. Cause he's like, man, you know, you know, one of the first things he asked me, he said, you know, cause we jammed a little bit. For first of all, let me back up. There was a story that I gotta tell. Yeah. Emanuela testimony. She, she 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 cringes whenever I tell the story, but I have to tell it. But when I first got there, you know, Takumi told me to come to the studio early to set up. And rehearsal was supposed to be at three. They moved it back to four. Uh, because he said, Hey, they went out to to the movies the night before they went to see Pirates of the Caribbean with Johnny Depp. This was back in two thousand four. Um, so um, 
He said, so yeah, they're going to be in late. So just go ahead and set up. And I said, okay. So I start, you know, practicing and loosening up. I didn't sleep, you know, cause I got the red eye in. So I was up the whole night, you know, cause of the anticipation. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, they started trickling in slowly, you know, around four o'clock. Um, first Rhonda Smith came in, then Renato came in, then John came in, and then Larry Prince came in. And, you know, Prince had these flip flops on, these white tube socks <laughs> and flip flops. And so anybody who knows the game knows exactly what I'm talking about. He always wore those around, you know, he didn't prance around them hills that much, you know later on because you know the whatever foot problems or whatever but he he just looked very laid back at cool and said hey man and you know i jumped off the stage i gave larry a hug i said what's up papa and i gave prince a hug and he shook hands and john came over and so we started talking and out the corner of my eye i saw this woman walk in the room and i was like wait a minute who is that <laughs> you know because I didn't, I didn't follow i didn't follow <laughs> prince's personal life i thought he was still with my take. I didn't know anything about, you know, them splitting up. I thought he was still married to her, but we were talking, you know, me, Prince Larry Graham, John Blackwell, and this woman walks in, black dress on, tall, long, curly hair, and I was like, who is that? And Prince (laughs) saw me look. I forgot Prince Larry Graham and John Blackwell was even standing in the room. (laughs) It's so this woman starts walking over to us, smiling, and she sticks out her hand. And she said, hi, how you doing? And Prince says, uh, Manuela, that's John. John, <laughs> that's Manuela, my wife. <laughs> and I went, oops. <laughs> so I was like, I was Stevie Wonder for the rest of the day. Hilarious. I was like, pretending not to see you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <That hurts. laughs> so we went up, we got on stage, and we jammed for a minute, and, um, we had a great time. And then he took me in the studio and studio B played me some stuff he was working on, you know, and man, he just really treated me like, you know, his little brother, man, you know, we went went around the studio, took a tour of the studio, you know, upstairs, the offices where Larry had this long pair of silver Bootsy Collin looking boots that he had from back in the day that was in his office. And then we saw the vault and went downstairs, we're on the third level in the garage where all in the base where all his cars are. So saw the the uh Alphabet Street Thunderbird that's in there. <laughs> the the yellow sexy MF BMW A fifty C I, that yellow one that's in sexy MF. He had a black Ferrari in there. And he had both of the motorcycles from, you know, Purple Rain and Graffiti Bridge. And then at the time he was driving he was driving a purple Plymouth Prowler. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Try saying that fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had, he had this really cool, tricked-out purple pun of Prowler, man. It was really nice. So. But anyway. And this is just like, you and Prince. How long you This is just you and Prince. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, and Takumi, yeah, Takumi, you know, had the keys and was showing me around the place. And so he said to me, hey, man, how long you want to stay in town? I'm like, well, I, I don't know, man. Well, I, how long you need me to be here? He goes, well, look. There's a jam that goes down Wednesday nights. There's a club called Jasmine's. He said, Takumi, set it up for him to, to stay. We, we, you need to go down there and jam. Kirk's band plays down there. He said, and they'll let you sit in. I'm going to set it up. I said, okay. So I stayed and Wednesday night at Jasmine's. They don't have it anymore. But that's that was the night on Wednesday nights. That's where all the Minneapolis cats come out. So all the cats from mm-hmm. Mint Condition, and all the MPG cats, you know, Damon, Tonium, and, you know, and all them. They got, everybody goes there to hang out. And uh, Kirk Spann was playing. And he had a super bad saxophone player, um, Walter Chancellor Jr. Really cool brother. Heard that Shout out before. to Walter Chancellor. Yeah, I heard that name before. Oh, yeah. Well, well, well Walter worked with Prince as well. He, uh, he was... Um, Involved, I think, during the Rainbow Children album because I think they were going to start a band together. They were, were going to, he's going to do a band, and so uh, Walter is a great saxophone player. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but he was playing with Kurt's band, and 
they called me up, man. They they treated me with so much love, man. Shout out to Minneapolis, man. Mm. First of all, uh, they showed me so much love out there, man. And uh, they called me up to sit in on base. And me and John Blackwell went and sat up there and jammed. And we turned the place out. And so I called Larry. I said, who want LG to come up here? Larry, come on up here. So Larry got up. <laughs> He got on bass, I got on guitar, and that was it, you know. And also, Chance Howard was in the band, too, at the time. Okay. Chance Howard was playing a bass set with uh, Kurt's band. So, um, but it was a really, really cool night, um, and that was a really cool time. So, you know, getting back to that Revolution gig, I'm going to tell you, the thing that made that gig the most special were the fans, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. The fans really, really, really made that worth it. It, it. And there was five people in particular because I had, the second day I almost quit the gig. I'm not going to get into the details as to why, but I had I had almost decided I had decided to pack my stuff up and leave because that's how thick it was like that tension was. Oh yeah. Yeah, man, it, it got a little, that's why, <laughs> I mean, I was only, I only played with the band for a week, but I felt like I was with them for 20 years. <laughs> mm, okay, okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, let me you know, ask you this, so who, who was the, when you was there, like, who was sort of the band leader at that time, or was there a band leader? Well, Mark, you know, I guess it could be said that it was more, you know, Wendy and Mark that were kind of you know, calling the cues because they were the f- people up front, you know, mm. and, you know, and then Mark, you know, in his, uh, you know, democratic way, <laughs> you know, was trying to try to lead things because, you know, you had to try to, you know, handle everybody gently. Mm. So n- you know, no one got bent out of shape, but, um, I was given specific instructions on how to, uh, deal with the situation. And like I said, but the bottom line is this, man, you know, when playing, like I mentioned, when you're playing guitar on Prince's stuff, you can't be no punk, you know, you can't be no Mark and you can't be all (laughs) refined and stuff, man. You got to let loose and you got to play. You know, I think Wendy said in the magazine article, you know, being a showboat. Well, guess what? When you're playing Prince stuff on guitar, you got to be a showboat mm-hmm. because he was a showboat, you know, you know, and he, you know, he put it out there, man. He, he, he that's why every time he played, he made you feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't, he didn't hold back, and so you, you really gotta just give your all, man, and. Uh, so you do that you, music justice or just or just don't play it. If you right. ain't going to do it right, then don't mess with it. So I, I can you know? only imagine it was probably like and you ain't got to confirm it, but it was probably trying to like maybe pull you back something and not be over. Not I'm not saying over playing, but it's just a natural sort of way. Just listen to your background, where you come from, how you're going to and how you appreciate the music, how you're going to play it one way. And if the other players could be playing in a different you might come out and just kind of stomp I don't say stomp over but is this a natural <laughs> it's just that I, I'm gonna just say is a certain swag and, and way that we do things sometimes that it could probably be intimidating yeah. if that person don't inherently just kind of have that you know rhythm to him where I could see where it might right. be like yo t- yo your man he's he gonna over he gonna outshine me we can't have you know so I, I get it you know I'm assuming yeah I, you know, and and, and- and, and, and let me just say, your you, your your assumption is very astute. <laughs> you're, you're on it, you're on it. Uh, but it wasn't even about trying to outshine anybody, man. Right. It was about paying respect to my brother mm-hmm. and playing that music to the best of my ability and doing it justice and doing it righteous. And because I know if he was there. And you wouldn't execute in a certain kind of way. He gonna give you the eyes. He gonna look over at you and, and give you what I call that like the controversy album cover stare. That's what I call it. <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> and anybody who works with him knows what I'm talking about. That co- he give you when he when he's not happy, he gives you that controversy album cover stare, and he gives you that look. But um, I know that if he was there and you weren't executing, you know, you was gonna get the look. Mm-hmm. And so I imagine that, and that's why I said, man, when I come through, first of all, Mark. Mark called me out there, so I didn't want to come out there and, and be weak, you know. I didn't want to overdo it, but I didn't want to be weak, too. And so um, he put his reputation on the line for me, you know. Mm-hmm. So I had to, you know, follow through and, and make good on that. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm thankful, you know, to him and to the band, you know, for having the confidence and and having me come out and do that i was glad to i wanted to go back to something you said i'm sorry go ahead i'm sorry no i'm done what are you gonna say oh i was gonna say i wanted to go back to something you sort of alluded to but we kind of went into a different area you said when you were talking with prince you said you realized he had a lot of love and respect for jesse in the time but you didn't i was wanting to know what you were what did you mean when you said that well, I remember. I know he referenced them a lot when we oh, were okay. talking, and um, and I because I I guess I kind of reminded him of Jesse because he kept he said you know Jesse, and at that time I hadn't met Jesse, um, and I said well yeah I know who he is, I said as a matter of fact we almost we're going to be labeled mates because you know John McClain uh, he's I said John McClain and Prince went oh, oh, oh my God you know <laughs> so I don't he's like I said yeah he almost signed me he said man he said you he said you probably just be getting out of that deal right about now and he's like you know he's like, yeah but I don't know what competition that was I think you know I was talking with Owen Husney and we were probably thinking that it was probably because John is the one that kind of helped put Jimmy and Terry on, you know, right. with Janet after saying, you know, when he fired him from the time saying, uh, we'll never hear from those guys again, you know? Mm-hmm. And then they, oh, they end up being the biggest producers in history, you know? But anyway, uh, I remember he was like, well, yeah, Jesse was over at A&M and, you know, they did three albums with him and, you know, well, the first album did okay, but the other two, you know, so we just talked about a lot of different stuff. Okay. And he just said, what do you want to do? What would you want to do? Do you want to, you know, be an artist or what is it? I said, man, I said, all I ever wanted to do was just be the cute little guitar player in the band. You know, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to be the guitar player, but every time I got in the band, I got hated on. So I was forced into to, to doing a solo uh, project and being a solo artist, you know? And that's when he said, I get it. You know, he said, cause everybody wants to be the boss until it's time for them to be the boss. Mm. And he said, and then he went into a story about Jesse, which I won't repeat because that's, you know, private and privileged information, right. but it just showed me though, how much respect and how much love he had for Jesse, like a brother, because you know, Jesse stayed with Prince when he first moved to Minneapolis. You know, yeah, I don't think a lot of people know that, but he stayed with Prince for a while <clears throat> in the Purple House and stuff. So, as a matter of fact, I think there's, if you go on YouTube, there's an interview about Jesse talking about that. So they were tight, man, and and then you know, they're both guitar gods. You know, mm-hmm. they 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 kill the guitar, man, and but. Prince always respected Jesse's guitar playing and he respected the time because the, the time is the band that he would have been in if he wasn't an artist himself, mm. you know? And I think all the guys will probably tell you that, you know, he, he, that was his, he said himself, that was his Frankenstein monster of a group he created, you know, right. cause <laughs> they used to wear him out. <laughs> 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 you know, that, it's funny because I, when I was talking with Fink and he would tell me stories about, about you know, how the time used to give them some heat when they were on the road, you know. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, but yeah, but he, he, had, he had huge respect for them, man. And and so I saw that's something that I know personally. That's not anything I have to make up. I feel uh, no. You know, 
I feel you. What did um, you know, it, it, what did you learn from that time that you know? So when you went to Minneapolis, I mean, what did you come away from? What did you come away with from that experience? You know, at that time. <clears throat> well, that you know, there's a deep love for music in Minneapolis. And Minneapolis has a huge respect for their musicians. You know, there's a you know, there's a there's a, there's definitely a, a camaraderie in the scene there. You know, and uh, they have they just have a lot of respect for musicians. You know, Prince respect musicians, man. And um, it's it's good to be in that kind of circle, you know, or uh, you know, just to have that kind of vibe around you. That's why all of them were so good, you know. Uh, oh, that's the one thing I could say. Definitely competitive, you know. Hmm. Definitely competitive, and that's why everybody's so bad because you know, you know, everybody want to be the best. You know, everybody's trying to be their best, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, so uh, yeah, man, it, it, it is Minneapolis. I guess I love Minneapolis. Each time I've been there, man, it, it's just nothing but love. And like I said, when I played with the it, when I played with the Revolution. It was the fans that sought me out. You know, I, I had on all black, you know, and I was in the corner out because I was specifically told to do so. So I went along with the program. Hmm. But people kept saying, wait a minute. You know, see, the one thing I can say, and, and I am not blowing smoke, I'm just being real. Prince fans are some of the smartest people on the planet. So you can't try to put nothing over a bill. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, can't, you can't try to put nothing over a prison because they'll, 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 they'll find out on their own what's happening. And what happened is they look through the shadows and say, wait a minute, somebody else is back there. Mm. And, and, and some people thought I was Dez. Some people thought I was Jesse, as you said. And some people, you know, they were just like, who is that? Mm -hmm. And so... When I was going outside of First Avenue across the street to my hotel, um, you know, I would walk. I wanted to walk because I just wanted to soak up the vibe, man. The energy was right. so strong mm -hmm. that week during there, you know, and I just wanted to be a part of that and soak up the energy for the people. And, um, you know, I, I only rode to the venue with the band the first night. Cause I was like, man, don't nobody know me. So I, I have the privilege of enjoying this energy <laughs> and Robbie pastor, Shout out to Robbie Pastor. Love Robbie Pastor. Yeah, I met that He's brother. Our, <laughs> yeah, he drove great guy, me man. He, out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was his job to make sure that the band got to the venue together in one piece. Okay. And I said, you know, and so I would want to walk. It's just across the street. You know, we stayed there at the um, Lowe's Hotel right across the street. And so I mean, it's just across the street, you know, and, I, and nobody knows me, so. So he's like, John, you're not going to ride with the band. <laughs> What's right. going on? I said, <laughs> is that him? That's him. I is only met him? him a few times, <laughs> but that's him. <laughs> he goes, J -j -j -j. I said, Robbie, I said, man, I, I just want to, I just want to stay real and, and soak this energy. I said, I'll be all right. He said, well, do me a favor. Could you please just call me and let me know you made it over there safe. Okay. I mean, just. I said, Robbie, it's okay. I'll be okay. I'll, you know, I'm a big boy. It's He's all right. <laughs> and, and so I, I get over there and I, I tell them I was over. So anyway, when I was outside, people would come up to me going, hey, you're the guitar player. <laughs> and I said, wait, wait a minute. You saw that? He go, yeah, man, we saw you back there. We saw you a couple of, we saw you say things a couple of times, <laughs> you know, because there was one point in the video that I think you got the video clip. In the beginning of Let's Go Crazy, Wendy's guitar wasn't working. Mm. And so at the end of the, in this life, you're on your own. Bum, bum. And so if I wasn't there to play that, it would have been a disaster because for some reason her guitar wasn't working. So it's funny how much the, band, the, the fans picked up on because the one guy told me that said, man, I saw you back there, you know? And so... By being hidden, it just kind of made me more of an attraction. Because <laughs> <All right. laughs> we were trying to figure out what was up. And then, you know, the homie Questlove was there, man. Shout out to Questlove. He was there and gave me props. And 
like I said, there was five people that that night in particular that really made me uh, realize what I was there for. Because I was, like I said, I was ready to throw in the towel the second day because the emotions was like all over the place. Mm. But uh, Matt Larson, Brenda Bennett, mm. um, it Matt Larson, Brenda Bennett, uh, and then Manuela, of course, and then um, this one lady in particular who came up to me at soundcheck on day two. And uh, oh, um, I can't I can't remember his name at the moment, but the fifth person will come back to me later. But he's a really really cool guy. Um, so these are the people that kind of helped me keep my head on straight. You know, but anyway, at Soundcheck, this particular lady came up to me and uh, she said, hey, I, hi, I just wanted to say hello. I, you know, you nailed those guitar parts note for note, spot dead on. I was on your side of the stage last night and I was enjoying every moment of your playing. You sounded amazing. And I was like, who's this lady? I said, I said, thank you so much. That means so much. And Matt Larson came up and he said, oh, John. You you don't you never met Susan Rogers? Oh man. <laughs> I just Susan Rogers, John Payne. And that when Susan came and told me that, man, that just blew my away. spirits just went up. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that after getting ready to just like say the hell with this, that she really lifted me up as well as the fan. one else there, man, who was in my corner and that they made that gig really worthwhile to me and and also when you know people like manuel and others are like listen yeah i remember you're here to represent your brother you're here to show respect and honor to your brother just keep that in mind that's why you're here mm -hmm. and i said that's right I, it ain't about me it's, it's about showing respect to p and so that's what got me through that man and wow that's a blessing like i said man i wouldn't change it yeah yeah i wouldn't change anything Ah, incredible. Yeah, Susan Rogers, man. Shout out to her. Uh such a uh I don't know, I, I would say she's such a, a a quiet, but her presence is just like, God, you know, she's just a very calm sort of a uh demeanor, but so knowledgeable, man. I've been around it's so soothing. Soothing. Yeah, okay. Soothing and and, and 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 quiet confidence and secure. It's like when she's there. Everything, it feels like a warm blanket. Somebody just laid a warm blanket <laughs> over you. You know, I was like, oh, okay. Everything will be all right. <laughs> you know, and and she was brought in because the first night, you know, the sound wasn't exactly what it needed to be. And so um, a particular young young lady, whose name I won't mention, she, you know, she kind of put the call out. It was like, uh, you probably need to get down here and put your hands on this. So she came and she helped the engineers kind of dial in the sound and stuff. And so she was amazing, man. She was, it was really a lot of meeting her and just to have her say those kind words really made my day. Wow. All right. And then also, too, you have uh, shown me, we, we didn't talk too much about like the bass guitar uh, and, the, and the designing with the company and all that. It's a company called Swing. Can you give us a little bit of the background on that? Oh, absolutely, man. Well, you know, I've been, you know, playing all my life guitars and bass, and, uh, you know, and I collect guitars and stuff, and I played on all kind of different guitars and different basses. And I had the opportunity to make my dream guitar. And what happened is this company, they approached me um, years ago, I, yeah, I was at the NAM convention. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I already had a couple of endorsements already, but, you know, you go there and as a musician and as a producer, you, you know, you want to stay up on all the top of the latest things and what's in the newest gear. And I sat down, was playing some instruments, and I saw this one bass company that nobody was really tripping on. And they had some really dope stuff. And I picked up the bass and started playing, and a whole crowd started gathering around the booth. <laughs> and... That was it. And, and the owner was like, listen, 
we want to build a guitar for you. Tell us what you want. How would you want to do it? How would you want it made? And we sat down and went back and forth over the schematics, and I told them what I wanted. So basically, I compiled every guitar that I ever, every, well, we started with the bass first. I mean, as you guys know, I play both guitar and bass, but I learned being in this business, when you do too much, people call you for nothing. So you got to focus on one thing. <laughs> so he, 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 he knew me as a bass player. So he got to know me as a bass player. So I decided to decide in this place and I put all the different basses I played over the year and put them into one bass. And the, the nucleus of the bass is a, a vintage Fender Jazz. Uh, and I started playing the Fender Jazz bass because that's the bass Larry played with Sly. Mm. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, I have one of Larry Ground's basses at my house. It's in my collection. And so uh, we started with that as the nucleus, and then I made my bass to be both active and passive. So what that means is that it could just have the straight, dry sound, but then it has a built-in preamp. So when you flip it to active... It has two 9-volt batteries, and it gives it this extra tonal quality and punch to the way you can make it sound like anything out there. So that's what I designed this bass to be, man. We designed it to be a bass player's dream, and it's been doing really well. Um, matter of fact, one of my clients will be playing it tonight at the Bammies Award. Um, um, uh, shout out to Troy Lampkins. He's going to be doing... Um, a set with Neil Sean from Journey and Narda Michael Walden tonight. They're playing at the BAMI 25th anniversary, and he's going to be playing one of my basses tonight on stage. Wow, incredible. So, so yeah, so anyway, um, as the word gets out, the bass has been doing incredibly well, and um, we unleashed the five-string version of the bass at BAM this January, and they all sold out. And so we're now in our... Next phase of uh, yeah, next phase of production. So yeah, man, that that was a blessing that just came that came to me. That that happened January of 2016. Mm. You know, before the uh, uh, you know the uh, unfortunate thing happened with us losing our brother. That happened in January when I got the deal, and so my goal was to get him one of my bases, you know, okay. I was like, Oh man, wait till Prince play one of these, <laughs> you know? Cause I also have one of his guitars in my collection. I have a five string Warwick bass of his. And now you guys are familiar with that bass he has that he plays with the eyeball on it, right? Yeah. One eye bass. Yeah. Yeah. The one eye bass. Well, I got the five string version of that exact bass. And because that bass was all white and gold at first when Warwick made it for them. He had it retained and put the eyeball on it. Okay. And so uh, the, the other one that I have is all white and gold. It's the five string. And I got it because Prince hates five string bass. He hates it. He, he calls it a mutant beast. He don't <laughs> think that a bass should have more than four strings. And so uh, by some miracle, I ended up with that bass in my collection. Wow. Uh, okay. But anyway... Uh, you know, I have a, I have a collection of different collection of different stuff, and so anyway, I was going to give him one of my bases in return, mm. and I had just put in the order for it to be designed, like right before he passed. Wow! And um, so, if you go on my Facebook page, you'll see it. You can't miss it because the color, obviously, it's purple sparkle. I think the, I sent you oh, a picture I see of it. it. Yeah, you sent it to me. Yep. Yeah, and so. Um, they had already started making it, you know, before he passed. And that was over a year ago. And so just in January, they bought it to the convention and they gave it to me. They said, listen, you need to just go ahead and take this home with you. Mm. So I have it at my house right now. Okay. And it's sad because that was going to be my gift to him. He never had a chance to see it. Wow, man. What, uh, and then, so I, I gotta say too. I mean, you, you you have all these. You've gotten these endorsement deals. You know, you're on here. Your name must be ringing out within those community of musicians where they can call you and bring you into things, man. Like, 
And I, I, I heard you early on. You see, you say you live in a Silicon Valley. Uh, sound like you said you have yeah. a, a daughter. Uh, I mean, yeah. Your life, man, is uh, sound like you, you, you know, you have you, you're doing good for yourself, man. Like things is is been moving for you. Uh, it sound like you, you kind of got a blessed life there, man. Like things is working out. You still, you're a musician. You're doing your thing. Uh, I mean, just talk to me a little bit. I mean, like, how did? It, what, what can you? Let me ask you this. I'm all over the place. Uh, as a dad, I'm gonna ask you this. As a, as a dad, you have children, you have family, and you've been able to do your creative work, right? Uh, since mm-hmm. being a young man, um, how are you uh, able to sort of? I won't say juggle, but how do you take these things that you've learned and now you can pass on to, you know, your family uh, and leave them an inheritance? Like how do how can other men, fathers, mothers sort of still be true to what their calling has been and make a way out of that? Like a lot of people can't get paid or don't have opportunities to do some of their creative work. You kind of may have told us a little bit earlier why, but I just wanted you kind of just to take us home with that to give us a little bit more, man. And like, how are you able to to walk this path? Well, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Well, first, you know, and I hate to sound cliche, but you know, it's, it's a collective state. That's the truth. And the number one thing is, man, you got to put your spirituality first. You got to put God first. Okay. And you got to follow the directions where the Spirit leads you to go. And that's the only way I've been able to survive as an independent artist in this business. Because keep in mind, all my career, I've been an independent artist. I've never been signed to a major label. I've never had an agent. I've never had, really never had a manager or anyone who formed for me and and went out and got these things for me. These are things that God has blessed to come my way, you know? And so I've learned that when you just kind of do your best to walk by spirit. Now, I'm not sitting here saying I'm the goody two shoes and I'm the perfect man. I ain't saying that because I got problems. We all do, right. but I do the best I can to walk the line. And I, you know, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I've never done any drugs. I've never done any of that. And I've always tried to live a clean life. So with that being said, I just always try to put that for first. And then, when having a family, that comes also at the top of the list. So there's been many, many opportunities I've had to turn down um, and pass on because it would interfere with you know my family life and me raising my daughter. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. and it's just now, just within the you know the last year or so, I've come to the place where I'm like. Ready to dive back in head first. So that's why I'm like, right as we speak, I'm in the process of, you know, uh, rebuilding my recording studio and upgrading everything and, you know, working on some different projects. And that's, you know, my daughter, she's, she'll be 11 now. So she's, you know, she's doing her thing, you know, and she, she sings and, and wants to play the drums and wants to play instruments and stuff. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be a show business dad if she wants to do that that's going to be on her you know mm-hmm. I'll be there to help guide her but I'm not going to be a Joe, a Joe Jackson and be like you know you got to do this you know because you know I was like I, I want her to be a phlebotomist myself <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I want her to I want, or, a vet, or a veterinarian or whatever because she loves animals you know because I've seen enough in this business to where you know <laughs> I you know I see what happens to females sometimes right right I it's, but it's but, you know, with the Me Too movement coming out, it's just now, just now, it's getting to a point to where I'm starting to feel a little better to where maybe she'll be more protected from some of the wolves that are out there, mm. you know, mm. and some of the, the shady things. So get back to answering your question. Um, just try to put my spirituality first, my family first. When gigs come my way, I, se- I select them based on how they'll fit around the template of my family, you know. Okay. Uh, and and so and like I said, that's one of the reasons why I was kind of bent out of shape about the revolution gig. I, it was a blessing, but th- that had been the first time 
that I had not taken my daughter to her first day of school because mm. I was in rehearsal. And so that's why that second night <laughs> when, uh, well, that second day of sound check, when things were getting back to me that were unfavorable, I was like, ready, like, listen, you guys don't know the sacrifices I made, you know, to be here. And I did it willingly, but I didn't do it to come and be involved in a bunch of nonsense. Now, you know, we're going to play music, let's play music. But all this other stuff, you know, the, the politics and the Hollywood nonsense, that can stay somewhere else. You know, we're here to honor our brother, let's do that. You know, so, but anyway, um, I'm, I have no regrets about doing that. And I have no regrets about what I've done up to this point. You know, uh, you know, sometimes as a musician and raising a family, um, you got to take on non-music gigs, you know, mm -hmm. you got to do things that are not music related because you've got to pay the bills. Right. And so, you know. There's some of that too. So it's about being self-sacrificing and just having a humble enough spirit to, you know, do what's needed. And so that's why when people, you know, when you're a musician, people like to say you have an ego or, you know, or think you're full of yourself. First of all, I don't think anyone with an ego would have agreed to be stuck in a corner. <laughs> And we're all black. If you had, if, if the ego was that big, you know what I'm saying? You know, because I realized when I took the gig that it wasn't about me. It was about showing honor to our brother. So. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, man. Uh, I was going to say one last thing I was going to say about your music and, you know, that time in the Minneapolis thing. You know, the, the, the thing about it now, too, is that, you know, that's, in terms some of that style that uh, in terms of the music th is kind of what's popping right you know i think is about to in some ways it has a resurgence oh it's back yeah but it's like it's now back. cats really want to get on that so i'm so i'm I, you know i put the call out to a lot of you know yourself you, you uh, andre jesse you know all them cats i'm like yo don't let these young boys <laughs> redo all y'all jams in that style because y'all they ready for it or or maybe y'all link up with some of these cats that's you know out there because they want that they, that that style is what's popping right now i mean and for a lot of older people like me it's just i'm like cool this i've been waiting you know for for that, yeah. that sound to come back i got you know and i got money now so i'm like where are they at you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? yeah well, man, well, it's going to take everybody coming together okay, and, and pushing the movement forward and making it happen. That's why, you know, people can say what they want, but I got to give a shout out to Bruno Mars, man. Yeah. Bruno is like the only one out there in the mainstream that's trying to do it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and, and I mean, I mean, we know it's not Minneapolis per se, the Minneapolis sound, but he's the only one that's out there that's got live bass and some guitar on his records and mm -hmm. funk trying to do the funk thing. Yeah, even though some people might consider it as being, you know, a little tame or watered down, as Michelle and Dick Lichella said in an interview, she called it karaoke. You know, she, she can't classify what he's doing as karaoke. And I mean, okay, that's fine, but let's embrace it. Because at this point on the mainstream stage, he's all we got. Yeah. He's all we got. He's the only one that's doing it. And, um, I think that there has to be a coming together of everybody who's left to try to keep it alive because everything is so fragmented, you know, and even within certain circles, there's, there's not the unity that needs to be there. Mm. And, um, people need to come together for the, not just for the movement itself, but for their own survival. Right. Right. You know, you know, you, you know, it's, for their own self-preservation, you need we need to link up. So, like you just said, it would be great to see some of these cats link up with some of the people that's out there right now. Like I, for example, I had thought that the time would have went out on tour with Bruno or something. You know, when they did uh, that Grammy oh, thing with yeah, them. I yeah, but I would love to see the time hooked up with Bruno or, or you know, like I think just recently Morris hooked up with Snoop. And yeah. stuff like that, because all them all them cats love that funk man and the yeah. Minneapolis sound. Yeah. All the all them hip hop cats, you know the OGs and stuff. They loved it. So, 
you're right. You're absolutely right. This is the time for it to, to come back. And like I said, I'm working on a record, um, and I'm taking my time with it. And I, when it's ready, it'll be ready. You know, I didn't want to be rushing it out and putting it out on a certain date to piggyback and curtail on something else. You know, right, I wanted right. to stand on its own, be it good or bad. Yeah, no, it's, so, uh, it's, it's the time, man. There's a, a couple of groups now that we're talking about. I, I don't know if you heard of uh, Tuxedo. They no. just they just dropped. They've, well, they've got two albums, but their newest one is a song with Zap. And it's cold. It's, wow. <laughs> and, it's, it, you know, and they, they embrace that 80s funk sound. Like, you know, and it's two, two white cats. Um, one of them's from here in Seattle. He was he's a he was a producer anyway a lot of hip hop stuff but that stuff is thorough it's funky I mean I, it, it, if it's dope it's dope you know what I'm saying so it's it's out there and you know they're not on no major labels nothing like that but now you know the way the industry is now like you you independent so you already know and plus you come from the Bay that's all of us looked at the Bay as the people that was independent putting out stuff uh you know hip hop and yeah. stuff they was they was once spearheaded a lot of that movement so yes. Yeah, Man, y'all gonna get you. Well, get your thing. Well, well, even with the Minneapolis sound too, man. The Bay Area people, quiet as kept. People don't know the Bay Area played a big, mm-hmm. big part mm-hmm. in the Minneapolis sound. Um, you know that's why there was no mistake. That's why there was no mistake why Prince was out here a lot and why he got a lot of his band members from out here and stuff. You know, and yeah. why he recorded out here. He, he he wanted to record out here because he was a huge Carlos Santana, mm. Jefferson Airplane, Sly and the Family Stone head. You know he right. loved it, and he know that it was based out here. And the plant is where Sly recorded a lot of his stuff, and so that's why Prince came out here and did that record. Yeah, man. You know, so we. Many, there's a, there's a huge uh, parallel between Oakland and Minneapolis. I'm sorry, shout out to him. No, I was going to say, I mean, because a, a, a lot of those cats that I looked up to, you know, of course, obviously you got Sheila, uh, uh, Levi, and Bonnie. Uh, man, I'm a big fan of Raphael Sadiq and, and Tony, 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 all that, all that stuff out the Bay, Bay Area, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. This it's, 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 you know, it, it was a, very powerful place for the music and like you said also for the independent music movement uh you know shout out to too short too short you know e40 i mean that dude (laughs) oh my homie e40 yeah he (laughs) all them cats man just hustling stuff out the trunk you know uh too short recording in his mama living room on his radio shack recorder and so hustling Mm. set tapes out you know straight out the you know uh, on the street, you know, you can go on YouTube and listen to Vala TV and listen to his story. It's amazing. Yeah, you know how he came up. So, yeah, man, um, it, it, was, it was a very strong movement here, man. I'm really thankful to be a part of it. Well, Mister Payne, uh, actually, Big Sexy. I know you've been. It's, it's been like school. We just in, sitting here listening uh, to the, to these stories. Uh, do you want to jump in here before we get up out of here? Yeah, yeah, I got a couple of quick things for Mr. Payne. Uh, since you are a Bay Area young person like myself, um, and I'm going to guess we're close in age, you know, give or take a few years, did you ever shop at or, when I was a youngster, hang out at Leo's Music in Oakland? Of course. <laughs> of course. You know what's funny is it turned in I, – I, um, it became a nightclub. It did with over the past. Yeah, it's it's closed now, but um, over the past couple of years, it was a club, and I just played a gig in there. I did a Prince gig, Prince tribute gig in there. It was back probably two thousand fourteen, fifteen, or something. And yeah, they turned it into a club. But yeah, man, Leo's Pro Audio was the staple for all of us broke kids who didn't have money to afford guitars. We would go down there and play on all that stuff. Yep. You know, <laughs> uh, all the, we used to watch TV. Like there was a show called midnight special and all that stuff. It's soul train. He, and you see Michael McDonald when he's playing the Doobie brothers, he had a Prophet five and the Oberheim 
that was the only place we could go to actually touch one mm. and, and play on it. And so Leo's was a very special place because this was before Guitar Center came out. That was, you know, there was like, I think there was only like two spots in town that had, that was a uh, music, three, there was three spots. There was Leo's, Best Music, and then Music Unlimited in San Leandro, which is where Shock G from Digital Underground used to work. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so yeah, we love Leo's Pro Audio, man. Shout out to Leo's. They they they, they hung on to the very end, man. I, I remember they used to repair a lot of our studio equipment because they had a repair shop upstairs. And, and shout out to Franklin Miller. You know, uh, you heard me mention Walter Chancellor Jr. earlier when I was in Minneapolis playing with that band. Uh, Walter and Franklin are real tight because Franklin is originally from Minneapolis. Anyway, Franklin Miller worked at Leo's Pro Audio for a long, long time, till the very end. Okay. But when I was in Minneapolis, Walter called Franklin and he said, man, who's this John Payne dude from out there? He out here tearing stuff up here, man. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, out here to stay. And so when I was in my hotel room, uh, I stayed at the American Inn Suites. I think that was called American Inn. It was right across from, uh, uh, what's that restaurant? There was a restaurant across the lot from it. I can't remember. Anyway, um, Franklin called me. He said, hey, man, what, what you doing out there? I said, what? He said, my partner, Rodner Chancellor, called me. He said, you're out there just making a bunch of racket out there and make, <laughs> causing a disturbance. So word travels fast, man, you know. But anyway, uh, shout out to Franklin Miller. He worked at Leo's Pro Audio for a long time, and he helped a lot of us uh, when we were setting up our studios and didn't know what we were doing, you know. Because he, he, he's another, he's a total head. He used Pro Tools inside and out mm. and was always up on the latest gear and stuff, you know. So a lot of, lot of history at Leo's. What made you bring that up? Well, you know, because I heard you're a Bay Area cat, and you mentioned a lot of places. And growing up in the you know seventies and eighties, I used to hang out in Leo's all the time. In fact, uh, that's how I got my little brief job in the industry because I was working with uh, oh geez, Rich Bandoni over at Fernandez Guitars, and that led to ah. you know Rich. Well, what's funny is. I don't know Rich personally, but I used to, the company I was with used to own Neil Sean, Neil Sean from Journey. They used to yes. own his studio called Gush, Gush Studios in Oakland. Oh, yes. And it was right on, on the Oakland and Fruitvale border in this little area called Jingle Town. And Rich Bandoni, I believe, was Neil's guitar tech or roadie or something like that. I used to hear his name all the time. Oh, they were buds. Oh, oh, yeah. There were a lot of friends. Oh, yeah. Good times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, so I got funny me working, and I got me introduced to Benny Collins, so I used to, you know, mm -hmm. be a little young, young roadie on the, in the early 80s shows and work with Santana a little bit. And you mentioned the plant over in Sausalito. I remember one day, mm -hmm. Rich asked me for a favor. I said, yeah, what do you need? He said, I need you to take this keyboard. It was a Yamaha DX7 out to the plant. Yeah. Plant. So I zip on out there, and that was when Night Ranger was doing her second album. So I hung out and watched yeah. court a little bit. It was great, man. You know, so I'm yeah. in the area, you know, dude, just like you. And now you got me thinking about actually going to the families tonight, to be completely honest. I'm thinking about taking a trip. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I got a session tonight, and I'm hoping to get over there because I want to see Troy rocking that bass. He's going to be, like I said, he's going to be playing with Neil and uh, um, Nard and Michael Walden as they do tribute, I guess they're doing a journey tribute or whatever. So, but yeah, man, the, the rich music history, very, very rich music history in the Bay Area, man. I'm so thankful to, um, to, uh, to have, uh, you know, had some part of it and have my feet in the water in it. And it's, it is still going, you know, there's a lot of new cats that's coming out, you know, you know, a lot of stuff has come through the Bay Area. A lot of people don't know, man, but you know, you know, uh, Alicia Keys, India Irie, Keisha Cole. Mm -hmm. uh, man, there's so many people who have touched in the Bay Area. Now, there's, a, there's a new artist out right now. 
and she just goes by the name of her, H-E-R, her. Oh, and wow. she happens to be the daughter of a, a friend of mine. She's very, very heavily pressed influence. She plays guitar, bass, drums, keys, write, produces, does it, everything. She's amazing. She actually sat in with us on our Purple Rain tribute show that Dr. Fink played with us. She played, she is, I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere, but uh, check her out. Her name, she goes by her, H-E-R, oh, okay. and her music's a, I see. her, just her, H-E-R. Yeah, I see yeah she's a big, big Chris player. She's amazing. And I'm not going to mention her real name because you've all seen her before, but I'm going to let you figure that out on her, on your own. Well, I'm looking but at her she's someone. She's someone you need to watch. Okay. Amazing, and I, I was glad glad to rub the elbows with her and and her dad. Her dad's a great musician as well. So, a lot of great things coming out of the Bay, and a lot of them are very tightly connected with Prince and the influence he's had. You know, and the, and, and the influences that he also had. You know, he got it from us here, so it's been it's reciprocal. You know. It's funny you just mentioned that the, the her, but she's like a mystery. Like they, I guess there is no actual picture of her face, is there? Exactly. Interesting. Okay. And like I said, <laughs> you've seen her before, but you're gonna have to figure out from right. where. Okay. You know, you've heard her. You've heard her name before, but you know it's come to that in the business where. Right. Hey, well, I just want to let the music speak for itself. That's a brilliant. You ain't gotta know though. what I look like. Yeah. You ain't gotta know what I look like. You ain't gotta know what color I am or any of that. Just let the music speak for itself, and that's what she's doing. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, sir, man, this has been a very enlightening show. Um, a lot of stuff, like I said, we didn't know before. Hearing your history and, and your <laughs> story, this is great, man. I imagine people are going to be wanting to uh, get at you. and, and no more. This is what I need. I need all the listeners old heads who knew uh, John back in the day, send me them Jerry Curl pictures. <laughs> hey, well, you know, you, know where, you know where the deepest roots of that would probably come from. Well, there's probably a few people in the Bay that know uh, some stuff. Uh, but, you know, when my first record was out, I got a lot of love from, from Chicago. Okay. Uh, you know, I, they flew me out there three different times. Uh, Probably shout out to WGCI, you know, and uh, all the stations out there, man. Um, Gus Redman and all the people in Chicago, man. They showed me so much love. I remember I played a venue. It's not there anymore, but it used to be owned by one of the Chicago Bulls, Cliff Livingston. It was a, a club called the Riviera. And, uh, man, we used to have that place rocking. But there's a lot of photos from that whole era, you know. <laughs> and uh, there might be some from my early times too, from the, you know, the lucky, the lucky Lion, back in the Lucky Lion day. Lucky Lion. That was a All club right. that we played here. Yeah, it, we that was our first avenue here in Bay Area. It was a club called the Lucky Lion. Oh okay. yeah, I remember and that. And that's that's where a lot. Of, that. Yeah, yeah, that's where a lot of bands got their start, like you know, Radiance and you know, uh, the, the together band that Levi Caesar used to be a member of. You know, Levi played with Prince. Uh, and all these different groups, Alpha Omega, a lot of different groups. So. Nice, man. You put us up on a lot of stuff to check out. Though. I'm definitely going to go check out that cinema. I want to hear that. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, wh where can people find you online if they wanted to hit you up? So you have like a website or you man, have Facebook? Or? Just hit me on Facebook, John Wesley Payne, and then my band, John Payne and The Hurt. Okay. That's my band, John Payne and The Hurt. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, like I said, we're working on a new record right now. But, uh, yeah, just hit me up on Facebook under either of those pages, either John Wesley Payne, and you'll see me uh, on stage. And matter of fact, too, we you know, yesterday was the one-year anniversary from us playing South by Southwest last year. Um, we did a tribute to Prince, uh, you know, it was a... Shout out to Des Dickerson and Andre Simone, yeah, and Wyclef and Mickey Free, um, Joseph Wooten, um, Michael Ebb, and all the other great musicians that worked with us. We at the last minute put a band together. Well, Des he was spearheaded the whole thing. We put a band together, and 
performed at South by Southwest last last year and did a tribute to Prince, and it was amazing. So if you go on my page, you'll see the video of that. Dez is playing, singing Purple Rain. And the audience was amazing. It was like Woodstock all over again. I mean, it, it was huge. The audience was thick. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff, man. We didn't even get, believe it or not, we didn't even get a chance to scratch the surface. That's you know, we got, uh, we got we got to save a little bit, you know what I'm saying? We, you know, save a little bit for you that. Know, but Let get so him. much. Yeah, we got to, as my man was a rock king, we got to give him time to get the first one straight. So we, you know, we gonna let him soak with this and marinate on this. But man, listen, I so appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing with us, man. I don't take that for granted. Um, and you know, we always try to make sure that this feels like home, man. You know, we 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 in this uh, as a fan and as a service to other fans, you know what I'm saying? So we love just learning uh, from your experiences. Uh, and, you know, like I said, you, you drop some jewels in this, man, and you, you really put in some things of how we can make certain moves in life. So that's what I sort of glean with, you know, for me. But I really just want you to know that we do appreciate you sharing with us, man. It, it means a lot to us, uh, and that's real, real talk right there. Absolutely, man. I want to thank you for having me on. And like I said, man, I you know, none of us can do it by ourselves. You know, we, you got to be open and let the universe just take you, you know, to where you need to go and just allow the spirit to move you. So, um, you know, yeah, you might be by yourself, but there's still people that have a part in making it happen. And so I just want to be, you know, humble and grateful and thankful to those people. I never want to take anything for granted, man, never. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for giving us your time and to listening uh, to our podcast. We always appreciate that. We never take that for granted. We try to work hard to give you uh, some value. Um, so, again, just want to make sure that you guys know that we thank you so much. Please stay in contact with us. You can find us on Twitter at Podcast Juice. Um, you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, just look up Podcast Juice, the Prince Podcast. And of course, uh, our Patreon family. You guys make it happen for us. Um, so we always give our podcast to you guys first because we really appreciate you, you know, spending, breaking bread and spending coin with us and making sure we have all the equipment we need and can do things and, and take this to another level. So please believe that we appreciate you uh, with that, as I always say. And of course, we appreciate Big Sexy uh, as being here as well. Hey, work it like a job. We'll see you next time. Peace.